Okay, this video is called, Is Brain Cancer a Joke? So what I'm, the reason I'm phrasing it that way is because everybody's worried about a brain tumor, about brain cancer. I can tell you, I almost never see brain cancer. It's rare, it's super rare. If you doubled the incidence of brain cancer, it would still be rare. If you tripled it, if you quadrupled it, if you multiplied it by five, it would still be rare. And the reason I'm going through this is because everybody keeps talking about, do cell phones cause brain cancer? Do cell phones cause brain cancer? And what I'm trying to say is that's the wrong question. The correct question is, do cell phones cause brain damage that make you stupid? That's a key question. And I say this because, you know, I work as a neuroradiologist. It's one of the things that I do. I'm actually, you know, board certified in three different specialties, but I do a lot of brain imaging, okay? And I do a lot of study of cognitive decline. I teach other doctors why patients become cognitively declined. And the reason I tell you this is because on a given day, let's say I look at 100 brain CTs and uh, MRIs about 30% of the patients will be fell and hit head. You know, it'll sometimes say patient on blood thinners or it'll just say head trauma. Usually it's fell, hit head. Sometimes it's a motor vehicle crash, something like that, but usually it's fell, hit head. And it's usually old patients who are half confused anyways. Okay, then I'll get about 10 headaches. Sometimes the headache will say rule out subarachnoid hammers. But the point I'm making is TBI, traumatic brain injury, super common. It's also very common to get rule-out stroke. Patient will have some vague symptom, rule-out stroke. Yeah, of course, occasionally you'll get a more major stroke with, you know, hemiplegia on one side of the body. But very often, it's just some little something's off, rule-out stroke. Okay, and then the most common thing I get is memory loss, cognitive decline, delirium, confusion, acute mental status changes, MCI, mild cognitive impairment, dementia, brain fog. That is super common. And it's so common that a lot of people don't even seek help for it. They go, oh, I'm just getting old. I'm having a senior moment. And what I'm saying is if you focus on how can I avoid cognitive decline, you will address all the major issues in brain health. And that's why I emphasize that. Because if you want to have good cognitive function and be healthy, that's what you focus on. And if you focus on optimizing your brain health, you're going to keep your coronary arteries clean. The brain's a lot more fussy and difficult to please than is the heart. Okay, and I said that plenty of times before, you know, I'm taking you guys beyond clean coronaries. Yeah, Esselstein is awesome with his keep the coronaries clean, but we're going to go better than that. Okay, I'll see, you know, some dizzy, ataxia, syncope means falling down, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, like I said, rule out strokes common. I'll get a couple of rule out meds, you know, work up for tumor patients. The vast majority of these cases are negative. Yes, of course, brain meds do occur. They're usually a relatively terminal event. Patients most of the time don't live very long after that. You can sometimes keep them going for a while with, you know, uh, radiation therapy, for example. That's a whole other topic. Okay, now, so the point I'm saying is traumatic brain injury, stroke, and cognitive decline, that's a horse. There's an old medical saying, when you hear hoofbeats, think of horses. All day long, tons of patients I see this. And then when I interact with patients for other reasons, let's say I'm doing biopsies or I'm just talking to patients for other reasons, or I'm talking to the doctors about their families, this is the stuff that's super common all day long. This is what you should worry about. This could happen to anybody. All right. On the other hand, there's diseases like Parkinson's disease, which is obviously an important disease, but it's uncommon. It's like a zebra in terms of its frequency compared to a horse. All right. And then there's really rare diseases like ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. That is super rare, super rare. I'll see maybe one case a year, okay? And the MRI usually won't tell me anything. There's some rare signs I can see, you know, suggestive of ALS. They're super rare, okay? Um, and then there's things that I think are just sort of nonsense, really, like Alzheimer's disease. And why do I say Alzheimer's disease? Because you know, I know you're going to read elsewhere, oh, Alzheimer's is the most common cause of dementia. I think Alzheimer's is a scam, and I've told you why before. There's no physical finding. There's no historical finding. There's no good imaging finding. Even at autopsy, they can't effectively, conclusively diagnose it, okay? So what I'm trying to say is what usually gets called Alzheimer's dementia, in my opinion, in the vast majority of cases, is the things like I've talked about, vascular dementia, like the deletory theory, or my own theory of excitotoxicity-induced dementia, okay? 
And there's more to it than that. I actually think Martin's Paul's no oh no theory of oxidative stress is a contributor to what I would describe as excitotoxic induced neurodegeneration. And by that I mean, you know, when the metabolic rate greatly exceeds the oxygen and glucose delivery. We'll talk about that in other lectures, but I'm gonna show you a couple pictures now of what these things look like. But it's important that you, you think about what really matters. And I can tell you, I've looked at a lot of writers and I look at the quality of their books and it's, it's a common thing I'll see that a writer was great when they're about 50 to 60 years old. And then when they're 70, they're sort of lost a step. They're no longer as clever and funny. Okay. And there's exceptions to that. There's some authors writing masterpieces when they're old, you know, uh, you know, like uh, Victor Hugo, for example. All right. But anyways, uh, I call Alzheimer's because I think, you know, it's a convenient way to sell drugs. Okay. This is Alzheimer's. Take our pill. This is Alzheimer's. Take our pill versus when you talk about all our theories, when, you need to have a good theory of disease because it tells you what to do. And when you go through deletory's theory or my theory of, you know, neurovascular uncoupling, you know what to do, okay? So, all right, let's look at a couple uh, pictures here of what these things look like on brain MRI and CAT scan. So this is a big subdural hematoma. This would be a chronic subdural hematoma, an old one. This is a more subacute to acute. Acute is usually more dense blood here. This is sort of a mixed low density, uh, higher density blood sedimenting out the heme down in gravity dependent fashion. So this is really, really rare. Okay, I see subdural hematomas, but not that much. You know, if, if you're working in a, primarily a trauma center, you'll see more of these where there's a lot of motor vehicle crashes. You know, there's some hospitals, that's what they are, trauma centers, and they're right next to a big highway, okay? But um, we don't see these that much. Okay, you do see them, and this is a big reason why all these felt hit heads get imaging. Rule out subdural hematoma. You can take this to the operating room, drain the subdural hematoma, and the patient, you know, you can save their life and they'll have a big cognitive improvement. That's an uncommon event, okay? Yeah, it happens, of course but it's not common. Okay, um, here's a small uh, perimesencephalic subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you know, this could be spontaneous, it could be a venous bleed, it could be an aneurysmal bleed, but okay, this is super rare, super, super rare. I'll see one of these every couple of years, all right? Um, here's an interventricular hemorrhage. This might be from the shunt placement itself for treatment of hydrocephalus. You can also get post-traumatic interventricular hemorrhage. I've seen patients on endocoagulation get spontaneous interventricular hemorrhage. But IVH, it's rare. It's really rare. I see IVH, intraventricular hemorrhage, once a year. Okay, so it's not common. All right, now here's the common stuff. Here's a normal brain, okay? This is what's called a flare sequence, flare right here, which is really like a T2 sequence with suppression of CSF signal, cerebral spinal fluid signal. So basically, a, what you all want to do in all MRI is suppress the background signal and then enhance, increase the pathology signal, the disease signal. So this would be a normal brain, normal sized ventricles with no significant periventricular abnormalities. You get a little bit of hyperintensity in the cortical spinal tract, that's normal. Okay, you get a little bit of, you know, of increased signal at the ventricular frontal horn tips, that's normal. Okay, but here is the problem. This is what I see all day long, every day. And this is why you might have heard me say, some patients can have 100 strokes, okay? Because there's these little silent strokes. These are also referred to as white matter disease. If you hear somebody say uh, a bunch of white matter abnormalities, this is what they're usually talking about. The vast majority of abnormal signal in the white matter. The white matter means the myelinated um, axons that travel between the cortex. Cortex means bark, like the bark of a tree. And that's also called the gray matter ribbon that's traced around the periphery of the brain. That's where the neuron cell bodies are. The neuron cell bodies have about four times as much blood flow as the white matter. So they're denser on CT. And on an MRI like this, they just have a little bit higher signal intensity than does the white matter. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is all these white spots, they're abnormal. These are a bunch of strokes. These are usually silent strokes. When I say they're silent, I mean that they usually don't cause a neurologic deficit. A neurologic deficit is something like paralysis of the arm or paralysis of the leg, weakness of the arm or the leg that's you know noticeable, detectable, significant. Okay, these often are just a person getting slower and stupider as they get older. And these are very, very common, okay? Most Americans over the age of 55 have at least one of these silent strokes, okay? Don't get me wrong, I see lots of clean brains. I see a lot of people who have clean brains into their 80s. But I can also tell you, 
it's pretty routine to see at least one of these things and I'll often see hundreds of them in the same patient. And I would think of this as being like Ehrlich's metaphor of popping rivets off an airplane, okay? Eventually the airplane's not going to fly too well. So this is why you want to keep your arteries clean so you don't become stupid, all right? Um, so these would be, this would, like the way, how would this MRI be described? This would be described as extensive periventricular flare hyperintensities, most likely due to chronic cerebrovascular ischemic disease, meaning due to hypertension, atherosclerosis, and of course diabetes is mixed in there too. And it could be due to the arterial capillary thickening, capillary thickening decrease in oxygen delivery due to hypertension or diabetes. It can also be due to overtreated hypertension, leading to not enough pressure to get the blood up to the upper parts of the brain. <laughs> Why do you think people have hypertension? To get enough blood to the brain. So you gotta be careful about overtreating it as well. Okay, here's your classic acute stroke. This DWI stands for diffusion weighted imaging, and that's a big improvement in MRI. It really became widespread in its availability about 10 years ago, and um, it's uh, it enables you to see a stroke immediately, okay? So a stroke on flare doesn't usually show up until about six hours after the event. DWI shows up immediately. ADC is um, a way you can tell how acute it is. So ADC uh, sequence will stay abnormal for about the first week. DWI stays abnormal at least two weeks, quite often stays abnormal for two months. Anyways, these are ways to time a stroke. But, you know, strokes, they're not that common, big strokes like that. So I would call that a cortical convexity stroke as compared to those previous periventricular silent strokes. Okay, now here's a big cortical stroke. This is the kind of stroke that patients often die from and they have, uh, you know, cognitive impairment immediately after the stroke. So this would be infarct-related dementia. It's uncommon. Okay, so here's a big stroke. You know, and I'll see these types of strokes occasionally, but they're not that common, okay? And this might be like atrial fibrillation, and they'll toss a clot and embolus up to the brain and occlude the middle cerebral artery. This is on the right side. It's as if the patient's feet were facing toward you. That's how you can tell right side from left side. So this would be a large right middle cerebral artery stroke, okay? And this looks to me like sort of subacute, acute to subacute. Okay, maybe a little trace uh, hemorrhage right down there. So anyways, uh, that's a big cortical convexity stroke. So cortex is gray matter ribbon. Convexity means it's outwardly convex, outwardly round, okay? So that also would be due to an LVO, a large vessel occlusion, occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. All right, but I can tell you this, <clears throat> this is, this picture, this CAT scan right here is hundreds of times more common than this. I see this all day long, every day. Uh, usually the patients are over 60 when I see this, but I sometimes see it in young patients. All of this periventricular tissue, it should look like this, okay? Instead, it's markedly low density. That's pathologic. That's due to those silent strokes. So what we saw is the, the bright white spots on MRI. This is what they look like on CAT scan, low density, fluid. You might call it gliosis, a little bit of edema mixed in with the gliosis, the fibrosis, scar tissue in the brain, brain parenchyma tissue replaced by destroyed tissue, okay, by scarring, okay? So this is a disaster of a brain, and this is a very common appearance for brains and Americans. You know, they just, we sometimes will jokingly call this cheeseburger brain. You know, they plug up all their arteries and so all their association fibers are trashed, okay? This is, this person is going to be cognitively very slow if not demented. Okay, and then here's what I want to show you. This is what I see most commonly. Very little, if any, periventricular low density. This is a CAT scan. You can tell because the, the skull is very bright, you know, from the bone density. Uh, CAT scans are all based on density. MRI is all based on signal. Okay, so anyways, <clears throat> the point I'm making is the majority of demented patients I see, they look like this. The brain is shrunken. You have an increase in the amount of cerebral spinal fluid, this dark stuff around the convexity of the brain, okay? And the brain is sort of sitting in this fluid. You look at the young brain. You show me the brain of a 20-year-old. This brain parenchyma is going to be out here just about touching the skull all over. You will, you'll barely be able to see any cerebral spinal fluid. It'll look like it is down here. A tiny bit of cerebral spinal fluid. A tiny bit of cerebral spinal fluid. You get these old atrophic brains, American cheeseburger brains, due to chronic apoptosis, due to neurovascular uncoupling. and um, they, This is what they look like. And I see this all day long, every day. I'll see this from across the room. Okay, This is so common... It, 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 some people would even call this normal brain for an older person. <clears throat> I've seen that. All these I've seen patients with a bunch of silent strokes, and you know their doctors will say that, oh, that's just normal aging. No, it's not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I also had an interesting experience. One of my neuroradiology friends, she did her uh, residency 
in um, uh, a hospital located in a Chinatown part of a big city, okay? <clears throat> and um, it was actually a Chinatown in Chicago. And uh, she told me that they were amazed at how good all these old Chinese people, their brains looked. They had very little atrophy. You know, they're eating the rice diet. The old timers were, you know, probably came with their families and they're still eating the old rice diets. And uh, they had relatively little brain atrophy, you know. People get head CTs for all kinds of reasons. Like I said, fell head, head headache, etc. Okay, here's typical hypertensive type stuff. Usually you don't see this many, but we do see these every day. Little hypertensive bleeds centrally is classic location for hypertension. Peripheral bleeds, they sometimes say that's something else called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is sort of officially associated with Alzheimer's, but Alzheimer's is kind of bogus as we spoke about before. And I think, how, I think hypertension is the main underlying cause here, as well as there's secondary issues. There's beta amyloid within the wall of the vessel. We don't need to get into all the details, but all I can tell you is the same patients that got these hypertensive hemorrhages, they also tend to have hypertensive retinal hemorrhages quite often. And um, it's a spectrum. It's not discrete diseases. It's a spectrum, and there's a tremendous amount of overlap. Here's a large focal hemorrhage right here in the basal ganglia, and that is a classic appearance of a hypertensive hemorrhage. These things are rare. How many hypertensive hemorrhages do I see? I'll see about two a year, big ones like this. I'll see these every day. Um, I bet I only see about two big basal ganglia hypertensive hemorrhages a year, maybe three. Okay, the little tiny bright spots right here, those are just calcifications in the basal ganglia, globus pallidi. And here's a calcification in the pineal gland. I see pineal calcifications all the time. And that might be because of F minus in the water. It might just happen anyways. But um, basal ganglia calcifications, we consider all this stuff normal because it's so common, but I don't really think calcifications in the basal ganglia globus pallidi is normal. <laughs> I think it's probably due to atherosclerosis disease destroying that tissue. Normal tissue is not calcified, okay? Average American doesn't age well. Okay, now here's <clears throat> what looks like a brain tumor, either a glioblastoma multiforme, often abbreviated GBM, or a MET. METs are much, 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 much more common than primary brain tumors, okay? GBM, yes, it's a very serious disease. It's a very sad disease. The patients, you know, often don't do very well. Um, they can surgerize this thing, but how well are you going to do if they take out your right frontal lobe, okay? Um, <clears throat> uh, they can radiate it, and that can, you know, slow it down for a while. They give chemotherapy. All of that can keep the patient, you know, alive a bit longer. There's some reason to believe that nutrition might help. There's a book called Stop Feeding Your Cancer by an uh, Irish doctor named Kelly that was pretty good. And he talked about some GBM patients doing well with dietary approaches, but I don't know much about it. People talk about keto, but keto sounds pretty kind of stupid to me. That Seyfried guy guide works on it. But all I'm trying to tell you is brain cancer is rare. I hardly ever see it. So don't think about that because you'll just be confused and you won't know what to do. But if you think about the stuff I've been telling you about the deletory theory, of uh, like mouse equivalents of uh, underperfusion of the brain, chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, and you think about my theory of neurovascular uncoupling, and you follow these lectures I've been talking about, the effects of EMF and cell phones and all this stuff, then you know what to do. Avoid all that stuff. I've sort of given you guys over 60 different things that cause brain damage, and each one you know seems relatively minor by itself, but they all add up. And the good news is almost all of them are avoidable. So anyways, just wanted to make this lecture to give a relative sense of how common the different diseases are. And by avoiding the common ones, you minimize your risk of all of them, including your risk of Parkinson's and ALS and brain tumor.